This morning we're continuing with Gurudeva's first meeting with Yoga Swami. Then Yoga Swami asked about the difference between Advaita and Dvaita. Gurudeva answered that both are true, depending on one's perspective. Yoga Swami smiled, obviously enjoying the way in which the disciple had grasped that it is not one and not two. Swami, well familiar with the controversy between the two schools of philosophy, was satisfied. Dr. S. Ramanathan, who was there, later provided the following insights. Swami once told me that the Mahavakya Aham Brahmasmi is not correctly understood by people who criticize Advaita Vedanta. Yet I regard for the Advaita Vedanta of Sri Shankaracharya as well as for the Siddhanta Shastras. One day when I was going to the ashram at Kolumbhutarai, I was thinking of the debate between Vedanta and Siddhanta. The minute Swami Swami, he sang a line from the work of Tayu Manavar. We belong to the group of learned mystics who have understood the complete agreement and equality of Vedanta and Siddhanta. <clears throat> then he placed his hands on his chest to indicate that it was the firm truth. So Vedanta and Siddhanta, that's an interesting point. A couple of years ago, I was with one of the Swamis from the Divine Life Society in Batu Caves near Kuala Lumpur, who was quite familiar with Gurudeva's teachings, really respects Gurudeva. He explained that Gurudeva taught Vedanta as it used to be taught. That was an interesting statement to start with. How did it used to be taught, right? <laughs> he said he taught Vedanta within Siddhanta. Oh, I said, okay, that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. In other words, to him, the Siddhanta was the theism, temple worship and all, the devotional service-oriented practices. And you learn that first, and then when you had a foundation in that, then you are ready for the monistic teachings. Another way of saying what he was saying is, Gurudeva didn't teach monism only he taught monistic theism. So monistic theism would be another term for Vedanta in Siddhanta. Their philosophical repartee lasted about 20 minutes. Finally, the grape juice arrived and Yogaswami offered it to his guests. That ended all discussion for the evening. Swami told them to begin their trip home as it was a long way. Taking Swami's leave, they walked to the waiting bullock cart. <clears throat> the devotees, still entranced by the enigmatic encounter, also made their way off into the night. Kumar Suryan, an astute man, was impressed and a little upset too. He, in, he interrogated Gurudeva. Why did you tell Swami you saw him at Nalur Temple this evening? I was with you the whole time and I didn't see him. Gurudeva replied, I saw him in the inner sanctum during the puja. He was standing there right in front of me. 
With that, the lawyer grasped the mystical nature of the relationship between Yogaswami and Gurudeva. Then we have Gurudeva's recollection of the first meeting with Yogaswami. One day I was invited to go to Yogaswami. Yanaguru Yoganath, and affectionately known by the people of the area as Yogaswami, was a magnificent man. No one approached him unless they were in the right mood. Because you get severely scolded if you weren't in the right mood. Some were literally afraid of him. That was his gate, so to speak. It was his reputation of being fierce. <laughs> so, he didn't need to lock a gate. He just had a fierce reputation, so and individuals wouldn't go there unless they were willing to uh, endure that. <clears throat> when within the radius of him, one could feel the atmosphere scintillating. One felt electricity in the atmosphere. Devotees would prepare themselves on the inside so everything was all right before visiting the guru. Just to take him a little bit of fruit, they would sometimes prepare themselves for three or four days. If asked when they would be seeing the guru, they would say, well, I'm not quite ready yet to see Yogaswami today, maybe tomorrow. Or I will go on a very auspicious day. This, this was because they didn't want him to look through them and point out something they saw in themselves that they thought he might see. He always knew when people were coming to him before they arrived. My meeting with him was unusual because I was introduced and he said, come on in and sit down. Everybody else prostrated before him. In the Orient, devotees prostrate in front of a guru, placing the entire body face down on the floor. He said to me, you come in and sit down. You don't have to do that. You and I are one. Then he started asking me the deepest of philosophical questions. I must have given the right answer each time. He seemed very pleased. As soon as he had asked the question, without hesitation, I spoke the answer. Then he gave me the name I hold today, Subramunia. You are white. Subramunia, Lord Muruga, is white. He told me boldly. He was my guru, my master. Subra means the light that emanates out from the central source. Just emanates out. Muni means a silent teacher and Ya means restraint. Subramunia means a self-restrained soul who remains silent or speaks out from intuition. One who speaks out from the inner sky. He showed me the book he had on Patanjali's yoga aphorisms. I had studied Patanjali too. We had just a wonderful deep and inner meeting. He treated me more like a brother. This did not surprise me, though, because I was so far within and not in the consciousness of being surprised, but it surprised everybody else. He made me eat food with him, and we parted. Before leaving, I mentioned to my guru that I had established an ashram in nearby Olivetti and would like to have his blessings. He said, fine, good, it will one day become a three-story building. And you are going around the world and you will feed thousands of people. You are going to build palaces. So of course, at the time, Gurudeva didn't know that palaces is the same word as temples, Kovil. So <laughs> you could say you're going to build temples. He began giving me many different kinds of instructions, such as you will return to America and you will roar. And when you come back here, nothing will be gained and nothing will be lost. He said, now you go and teach the realizations that you have had. I was used to being told what to do by my six teachers on the path, so I was happy to have this positive instruction. 
After I left my guru's presence, everyone started relating to me differently. End of story. Have a wonderful day.